We welcome everybody to the ANS webinar on International Data Week, what happened in Denver. And this is sort of a joint webinar. Um, Andrew Chaw and I, my name is Stephanie Kittes, will be talking for part of the time and then we get perspectives from a variety of participants of the International Data Week. So this is a brief outline. We'll just give a brief introduction and overview of the International Data Week and then we have eight people talking about specific aspects sessions, outputs, things that they liked along the way in, during International Data Week. Okay, to give a little bit of context, CoData um, holds a conference which is called SciDataCon every two years and this conference has um, a research focus. The Research Data Alliance, as you may know, holds a plenary every six months and the current plenary was the eighth plenary, so we've been doing this for four years. And the plenary events have a strong practice focus and are meant for the research data lines working interest groups to come together and um, advance their work on their, on their goals deliverables mm -hmm. and also to bring people together to set up new interest in working groups, engage the interest for them. So having those two things happen pretty much at the same time gave an opportunity for the plans to align, as Andrew put it. This is the first time this has been tried and this resulted in International Data Week which had um, two days of SciDataCon on the Monday and Tuesday, a day in the middle called International Data Forum and two and a half days of the Research Data Alliance plenary at the end. So the whole event ran from pretty much Monday morning till Saturday afternoon. And if you were involved in co-data governance, you were doing things on the Sunday before and there were even some uh, co-located events on the Saturday. So this was the, the intention of this was to bring the International Data Committee together. Um, it also exhausted everybody, I think, although that wasn't the main intention of the event. Um, just to give some numbers, um, <clears throat> altogether, International Data Week had over 800, I think 816 participants from 42 countries, which meant they attended some part of International Data Week, not necessarily all of it. Um, SciDataCon had about 640 participants, and the RDA Plenary 8 had 551 participants from 33 countries. It was very good to see that 21 Australians yeah. registered for the plenary. Um, the plenary had about just over 70 breakout sessions where the groups came together and did their work. And personally, I was extremely surprised to see that over 60 people attended the RDA for Newcomers session, which happened to take place on Thursday morning at quarter past seven. So I was immensely wow. impressed to see nearly 70 people in the room. Yeah. And that was, that was really great. Okay, I'll now hand over to Andrew. And so essentially all of those numbers, at least for the RDA uh, segment, uh, can be right regarded as uh, having increased from previous years. Um, so that's kind of consistent with the general growth trajectory for RDA as a whole. The people attending RDA for newcomers, uh, I mean, this was an innovation that we introduced in Plenary 3. Uh, and we've done ever since, and this is clearly meeting a need. One of the characteristics of RDA, I'll talk about the themes in a minute, one of the characteristics is that the plenary moves around, um, so it's held in different locations each six months. And as a result, uh, it picks up lots of people in the country or the region that it's in who've never gone before and, and don't really have any good sense of what RDA is and how it's different. And so the RDA for newcomers is a great opportunity for those people to, um, to get a, a quick overview of uh, what we're trying to do and some sense of how the, the plenary itself is structured. I was also particularly pleased with the uh, significant increase in the number of Australians, which is great. So the, the themes of the event um, were varied, but there were some kind of common things that ran across them. So Cydaticon, as Stephanie has said, is um, much more like a, a conventional conference. There are you know, traditional papers, and not actual paper, but there's publications that are associated with that. People speak. There's short questions of clarification. And this year they said, even though the, the committee is the, um, the committee for, on data for science and technology, and even though CoData has traditionally had more of a policy focus, 
this year they decided that they wanted to look at research data infrastructure. They wanted to talk about issues of data sharing. They had a particular focus on sensitive data um, and a particular discipline emphasis on Earth and space science. The International Data Forum was in the middle and it was intended as the sort of the overlap day between SciDataCon and RDA Plenary. And a number of the stories that came out of responsibilities of scientists, scientists in quotes, because it was deliberately all research, not just science, and some of the data stories picked up the theme of sensitive data that SciDataCon had already talked about. And as you'll see in a little while, some of the talks that Stephanie and I liked best uh, were in that, that kind of overlap area. The RDA plenary doesn't really have themes the way a normal conference has themes. So a normal conference will have themes to help people structure what they're putting in under the call for proposals. RDA plenaries typically are much more focused on doing stuff. And so these were not explicit themes, but they were themes that ran across the two and a half days. Um, so the first theme was that of the increasing momentum in RDA. This is an organisation that's continuing to grow, um, continuing to um, have people become interested in it. The second theme was the theme of the impact that RDA is having through the results of its working groups and interest groups. And the third theme was the adoption of RDA outputs. And so to talk a bit about those, here is a list of the adoptions that were featured at this particular plenary. So the Brokering Governance Working Group had a series of recommendations for how you might construct um, connections between infrastructure components so that they go for a broker. You have a series of one-to-one -one connections into the broker rather than having to come up with multiple point-to-point -point connections. So that one's clearly got a very infrastructure builder focus. The Codata Summer School Working Group is more focused on um, providing how you would provide researchers with um, skills in working with data, uh, using a train-the-trainer model, explicitly targeting uh, Africa. Um, generally low and middle income yeah, countries. Yeah, low and middle income countries, but I think they had a particular focus on Africa this year. Uh, the Publishing Data Services Working Group, which is co-led by Adrian Burton, um, had a, uh, its recommendations revolve around a thing called the SCOLEX framework, which is a framework for connecting together different infrastructure elements within the overall publishing data ecosystem. Uh, the Biosharing Registry produced a whole series of recommendations on how you might describe elements within the life sciences. And the Metadata Standards Catalog is attempting to do the boil the ocean task of capturing all of the metadata standards they can get their hands on. Uh, in addition to those two out, that set of outputs, you notice those are all listed as WG on the slide. These are working group outputs. We have what we call um, supporting outputs from interest groups, a very comprehensive set of principles on legal interoperability from that interest group and the 23 Things material uh, coming out of the Libraries for Research Data Interest Group now translated into lots of languages. And it was very pleasing to see the astonishing success of Anne's promotion of the 23 Research Data Things uh, in Australia being highlighted at that event. In addition to those outputs, so the outputs are effectively, here are things that you can pick up and use. We had a whole series of talks at the plenary about, well, talks from groups who were actually adopting stuff. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. We have links at the end that we'll highlight when we get to them that point to the videos. If you're at all interested in looking at how RDA is making a difference in the activity of particular communities, I strongly encourage you to go to the adoption stories section of the videos because there you've got people who aren't necessarily infrastructure builders talking about how they're using these outputs to improve either the support that they give to people in disciplines or the actual work they do themselves. So, for instance, the um, data citation of rice genome data is a strong focus of the interest group in agricultural data at the moment. Um, 
So I, rather than try and summarise those, I would encourage you to uh, go to those videos and have a look at those links. Maybe one comment. Yeah. Um, the data citation working group recommendations have been adopted by quite a few of those mm -hmm. um, adopters. So um, that might, if you're interested in dynamic data citation, it might be worth having a look at what's been done with those. Yeah, and some of you may remember Andreas Ralba gave a uh, talk about that early this year, late last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he was out in Australia and uh, we, we said, great, wonderful you've just come off the plane. Here's the shower and now we'd like you to give a talk. And the recording of that is available from the ANS events page. Yes, of course. Thank you. So, um, so that's to give you a, a sense of some of the, the activity that happened. We then thought, rather than just point you at the, the websites for these three different events and say, have fun, we thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about some things that we liked. So Stephanie and I will start with things that we found of uh, particular interest at the event and then we have perspectives from a number of other Australian attendees who will talk about what they liked. So two things that I wanted to highlight. The first was going to be a birds of a feather session called Mapping the Landscape, which was really bringing people together who are interested in the topic of how do we map out all of the different activities that are happening in this area and get a sense of what's going on. And this was something that the Hyperactive Leslie Wyborn organised. And over the course of the week, she kept bumping into people who said, oh, we're doing a mapping the landscape activity as well. And oh, did you know those people are doing a mapping the landscape activity? And so that by Friday, when that session was actually held, it had actually turned into a mapping the landscape of mapping activities. So I was trying to get a sense of who are all of the other people who are trying to do mapping the landscapes in various ways. And that for me was a real demonstration of two of the benefits of bringing lots and lots of data nerds together into one space. Uh, the first is that you've got lots of people in one spot who you otherwise wouldn't normally see. And I've, I've said in the past that if all that the Research Data Alliance did was hold meetings twice a year, that would probably be in, that would that alone would add value. And the second thing is that you bump into people and you have these serendipitous conversations. So Leslie didn't know a lot about, about a lot of these things. I didn't know about a lot of these things. And so as a result of these serendipitous interactions, she was able to make that session much better. The, that group recognised, yep, we are all trying to solve similar problems and we should, we need to try and do this in a more coordinated way. And so this is going to be a birds of a feather that's going to turn into an interest group and the interest group in fact is already, or the proto-interest group, were um, already starting to think about are there particular tasks that we could spin off as working group activities, which is in my view precisely the way the RDA process is meant to work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight was a whole session on building a disciplinary worldwide data infrastructure. Uh, this was on the International Data Forum Day. And so this was essentially a whole lot of groups reporting on well, how, how do we do infrastructure in our discipline and what are the science, in quotes, drivers for it and what are the lessons we've learned. And this was very broad, so you can see it's not just hard sciences, it's linguistics and digital humanities. Uh, and as a, as a quick way to get a sense of how different disciplines differ in that's a very good way of doing it. I should also mention in this context the closing keynote for the International Data Forum Day by Christine Borgman who spoke about some early research that her group has been doing essentially on the same thing, looking at disciplinary differences around data sharing and there are some huge differences around data sharing and I think it's, it's valuable for us to not just assume that data sharing is the same for everybody uh, and we need to recognise there's a lot of nuance there. Stephanie. Okay. So um, I'll talk a little bit about two things that I liked. One of which is because my background is in qualitative research, um, I've always been interested in how to share and when to share personal sensitive research data. And I particularly like to talk in one of the CIDATACON um, sessions on that, 
by Neil Walker, who talked about data anonymity and the fact that in many cases data anonymity actually makes data access harder because um, it looks like it works but it, but it doesn't really and he brought a couple of examples of um, how and why the anonymization does not work. So for example he had one data set that he mentioned where someone looked at a specific disease and aggregated the data by country. Now in theory that would have been great but for example in France there was just one person, two persons who actually came out of that data set. One was male, one was female. So the de-identification really didn't work mm -hmm. in that case. And that's something that I, I've actually, um, I find quite interesting. The second thing I like is more a process kind of thing. After having had several days of conference where someone stands at the front and talks and everyone in the back sits and listens or does their email, what I found very refreshing was the um, interest group for archives and records professionals in RDA, which for the second time in a row that I'm aware of, um, actually set up in their breakout session, little breakout sessions. So they make little breakout groups um, with specific topics and really brainstormed and worked through the, through the issues that they um, gave us to, to discuss. And I found that a very refreshing and a very um, much more interactive way. And I felt I was contributing way more than in a discussion where you have 30 people in a room and you know one person says something and the other 29 are listening. So I, I really enjoyed that and thought that was a very good way of doing this. Now, we have a list of people that have volunteered or have offered when asked to provide their perspectives. Okay, so Malcolm Walsh okay, and so Griffith Malcolm. Uni. I guess other than the opportunity to, to network, the one uh, we were asked to think of something in particular, uh, one of the interest groups I've been involved with for about 18 months is the, uh, calls itself the long tail of uh, research data interest group. We were going to have a meeting at um, Denver, so we decided just to give it some focus. A few of us tabled a document, um, 10 ways to support the long tail of research, but it quickly became apparent uh, that we'd missed the target completely. So what, the way the um, meeting agenda, the interest group agenda was, we tabled the document and then uh, had 10 two-minute speakers uh, to, to uh, respond to the document. And we had the likes of Christine Borgman, uh, met someone from Mendeley and Figshare. We had a rep from the Open, European Open Science Cloud. Uh, so a really wide variety of different uh, senior representatives from different groups, if you like. And as we worked, they went through and gave their two-minute response. Uh, most were didn't like what we'd written. Not that there was anything wrong with the content, uh, but missed the target. The end result was that we should be, if we're targeting funders, we should be thinking about the long tail of research data in terms of orphan data rather than our perspective, which is the long tail of research. But I guess the key, the interesting bit I found about the whole exercise was nine or ten people from a wide variety of international organisations talking for two minutes uh, can come to a pretty quick conclusion about where we should be heading, which is a, very hard to do through a, an online interest group, but also typically other conferences where you only get one or two of those people speaking. You don't actually get them in a room to contribute to a 90-minute a, a discussion on where to from here. So I found that uh, particularly valuable and I d don't notice that in many other conferences where you get a lot of uh, broad spectrum uh, from all sides, from institutions, from vendors, from uh, government representatives, from uh, uh, you know key people like Christine Borgman talking to a particular topic in a practical sense. Thank you very much, Malcolm. That that was very interesting. Um, Hamish Holloway, are you there? Thank you. Um, Hamish Holloway from uh, Griffith University and the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation. I was fortunate enough to also attend Research Data Alliance um, in Denver. I actually kind of found it um, to be quite a 
good organisation, uh, with a good method to um, both network but also to um, understand how a lot of the larger uh, collaborative programs, so the sustainability, uh, global sustainability goals, the group of Earth observations, how code data, how side data and RDA actually um, work together to actually uh, promote and formalise you know, best practice um, and standards and actually to get much greater awareness across this kind of landscape. It was uh, also quite, uh, I, uh, sorry, I also attended a workshop called the, well an interest group called the uh, Virtual Research Environment Science Gateways and uh, opportunities for developing a more coordinated approach to support interoperability across different systems. Uh, this is of particular interest as it provided an international perspective on the things that we classify here as virtual laboratories and how in Australia we've been doing and what, what is the challenges and lessons learned um, uh, in an international context. Within that, uh, within that session there was, uh, uh, well, there was three speakers, four speakers, me included, um, but there was a speaker from Purdue University who was leading the Nano Hub or Hub Zero initiative which has got about 1.4 million users at the moment. And then there was also a um, person, Demetrius, that was leading a virtual research environment uh, in the UK. What it was really actually, um, the what was quite interesting is that um, I think Australia is actually quite organised actually in this approach within virtual uh, laboratories and the infrastructure that we approach. But sustainability came up as a, as a key issue um, and, and, and how do we actually kind of grow Grow these kind of services, and there was, um, there was similarities across those international contexts. So there was the you know that the approach of expanding vertically quickly um, uh, to provide that proof of concept and also show value was um, universally recognised. Uh, you need to also you know always be justifying your existence and measuring your impact. And in measuring impact is not just always about users, um, but it's about what they do with that, and that could be research and government. Um, and also that a, 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 a strong kind of method that, that when you're approaching developing these environments is that really you're starting a small enterprise as such. It's not just a program or a, or a platform. And you need to think about uh, learning and you need to think about teaching and how you actually integrate this within to curriculum and into research practice. Uh, particular note there from Hub Zero and Nanotech was that you know, they see uptake in learning for their research tools, so in education first. And there's about a nine month lag before that actually comes into research, despite having a, um, a research driven agenda. Uh, that's just quickly from my own perspective. Um, the, the breadth of topics actually was quite bewildering. Um, you know, anything from social to biodiversity to um, to health, um, over digital humanities and everything in between. Um, and it was a great networking event and a lot of people attended. So, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Hamish. Um, yes, it, it was a bit overwhelming, I think, <laughs> for all of us. In yeah. fact, having uh, nearly seven days of this was uh, quite quite overwhelming. It is possible to have too much data. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, next, Sarah, Mr. from Ursa, if you're there. I am here, and uh, yeah, so I'm Sarah but I'm from eResearch SA in South Australia, and just quite grateful to have power at the moment. <laughs> um, so I recently became the project lead for the RDS uh, 1.6 Cultures in Community uh, project, so I attended the um, RDA plenary sort of in that context. So I was particularly interested to sort of um, find out what the interest groups around the digital practices in history and ethnography and the um, archives and records professionals um, were sort of doing and, and what was happening in those spaces. And Stephanie, I guess my experience was similar to yours and perhaps my favourite thing was attending that um, archives and records uh, meeting and just the sort of interactive nature of it and um, being able to sort of participate actively rather than sort of listening <laughs> as a participant. Um, so, I mean, I sort of broke off into a working group around um, skills and training for sort of archive, uh, digital skills and training for archive professionals and was sort of able to share uh, what some of our plans were in the, um, in the RDS project and some of the things that we want to achieve in the next phase of the project. 
and really enjoyed that opportunity to sort of like be actively engaged. I also, this was my first RDA plenary and sort of feel like quite a newcomer to this space. Um, so I enjoyed the newcomer session and um, yeah, I thought it was a very positive experience. I learned a lot and I think what I really wanted to achieve was to sort of improve my understanding of the research data landscape and I think it did that. I think moving forward, um, I really want to see how the outcomes of the um, RDS project, um, how they sort of pan out and how we can feed that back into the um, that archival interest group. So yeah, so thank you Anne for the opportunity. Okay, thanks very much Sarah. Okay, the next speaker would be Richard Lyons from the Victorian State Government Department on, and I'm, I'm sure I'll forget something, uh, it was jobs, transport, economy, resources and something else. Richard, if you're there, I've got your slide here. We're, we're from the Department of, uh, Department of Economic Development, Jobs, Transport and Resources. So, well done Stephanie, it's a mouthful and we're part of the Agricultural Victoria portfolio. I just reiterate my to Anne's for supporting us in attending the RDA. I found the RDA and both Kieran and I found the RDA a very well organised, it was an exceptionally well organised event. It was also really heartening to see so many interest groups trying to grapple with some of the problems that we've been noticing in our closets, if you like, in our work practice and place. And um, so the sort of pragmatic, practical approach of conversations on a global scale was really something that was outstanding. And so the thing that stood out to me was, from, for, from my own particular point of view, is that I attended a number of, of the sessions, including the archives one, and I too found that uh, really useful. And across the sort of five or six areas that I focused on, I, we began to be able to build a map of all of the various elements that uh, we're having to grapple with in our work in relation to data management. And so I've mapped that out there just um, a, a, through as a, probably a couple of hours just of thinking and discussing this with a few people. And it is the case that our department actually touches almost all of those areas. So we've got one of the most complex working dynamics that I've ever experienced in my working life. And so we touch just about all of those um, elements in the matrix. And so it was, um, and then we also observed the various activities around or the, the enabling features, data management plans, interoperability strategies. Uh, and so on. So to be able to put that all together in a bit of a, uh, a landscape was the most useful thing to me and we hope to work with a number of our stakeholders to actually create some web resources to link all of this uh, to provide some and link to RDA activities in all of those areas over the next six, six or so months. And uh, we also took into the uh, meetings a very strong interest in archival and records management because of uh, particular tool that we've invested in in the department and we were exceptionally um, pleased to notice that that tool seems to be um, you know well conceived and um, for, for what many of the people are grappling with so we're very pleased to have that sort of feedback so I will stop there I think and just thank you once again to Anne's thanks very much Richard Kieran Murphy also from the department did you want to add something uh, yes, uh, Stephanie uh, and Andrew, thanks again and just echo Richard's um, thanks to Anne's for the support to, to head over to the conference. It was um, um, certainly, you know, I'd, I'd say it's the best uh, event I, I'd been to in my um, professional time here at the department in, in 10 years, um, maybe selfishly because it's very much right down the, the problems that Richard said we've been grappling with. and. I was, I was a little bit um, concerned before we left, you know, with some of the, the, the um, you know, the, the, what the world we're in and going there with the quality of the speakers and presentations there that um, you know, could have been a little bit too, over, over my head, but um, it was right down our alley and um, we've got so much from it. So thanks very much, um, yeah, to, to Anne's for the support. I, just a really practical example, you know, obviously the newcomers for RDA session was really valuable to go there and, and I think there was, I think Stephanie might have said there was, there might have been 60 people at that session, or 60, 80, so had looks that the, um, 
the, the RDA models growing. Um, there's a lot of new people there. So basically being a newcomer and then um, participating in the events during the week and all the breakouts. Um, obviously really excited to go along to things such as the um, you know an emerging interest group in uh, agile data curation, which is a really um, data curation is a is a is a high priority capability area that we're focusing on in our in our area, and I know we're called the big long name, but we we also are a branch, we're a division called Agriculture Victoria. So whilst we're representing Dejta, our interests are in the agriculture sector, but obviously the lessons we've learnt there will be spread further across the department. So just probably uh, I've got a lot of notes. I've actually only just landed back in the office today. I, I, I took a few days off since when I got back from from the US because Richard and I extended our visit to to um, University of Illinois and um, uh, post post Denver, so that was really valuable because all the lesson, all the learnings from Denver got um, supported and I guess furthered in, in in what we what we worked out in um, at the university in the context there. So um, I'll, I'll have some time to gather my thoughts and put together our report, and we will happy to share that with everyone. But um, as Richard said, it really does align to the problems we've been grappling with product that we've, the tool that we've developed in the last few years which was very well received over there and we hope we can contribute that to the Australian um, landscape in whatever shape or form and I'm sure we'll be doing that through ANS. But practical take home is around that, uh, the working groups and the interest groups in Agile Data Curation as an emerging interest group which I've joined and then the working groups that reported on that, I, I guess really relieved to see some of that work that the commons and the um, fair principles have, have created. So I won't go on too much longer, Stephanie. Thanks for the giving us a chance to to catch up. <laughs> thanks, Kieran. And maybe we can talk about um, say if you want to present your report as a blog post or something like that, yeah, we can help you now. Okay. And Anita, how are you there? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. I again am getting feedback. I think it's better now. No, it's improved. Yes. So thanks again to Anne's for. Um, uh, contribution towards going to the uh, to the sessions. In fact, if it wasn't there, um, I'm from TURN Ecoinformatics at the University of Adelaide, and mainly work on the ECOS portal and also the shared data submission tool. And we're basically on subsistence money, so it was really important to visit. And for me, I guess in terms of what we do here, I'm in the data sort of publishing realm and I guess my role is trying to um, merge or bring together publishing policies in a way that really reflect long established science practice. And I've been reading a lot about the co-data recommendations and papers and that and also the RDA recommendations. So it was absolutely fabulous to actually get there and see how these two groups um, work together collegially to sort of guide us um, in an international uh, sphere in this area. So that was really, um, really important to participate in that. Um, I was kind of like a kid in a candy shop. There were so many things that I could have gone to of interest. But the one that really stood out for me, and it was mentioned in Simon Cox's talk in the plenary, but also it was mentioned in quite a few other sessions, and this is the notion of trustworthiness of um, the data that is um, published openly in repositories and things like that, and, and how the recommendations that are coming through in terms of principles and guidelines um, through the RDA, through the various working, from the various working groups may well um, give some kind of basis for working out or identifying the levels of trustworthiness in terms of our infrastructure. So that had huge implications for the kind of systems, uh, the infrastructure that TURN has. And, um, and it really overflowed in a whole range of areas. It came through in terms of ontologies and, and genera generalities you could have in ontologies in terms of control vocabs. It came through in that. It also came through in this whole notion of reproducibility and the different, like I hadn't realised there were three levels of reproducibility or three types of reproducibility. So that was absolutely fascinating. Going forward, um, I guess from a turn perspective, it would be really great to be used to use some of our infrastructure as case studies for 
the next lot of working group activities, particularly in the um, publishing data services and in that space we'd really like to be involved in that. So, um, and it's good to feel that you're not alone in thinking about these things, it was really great, thank you. And also, um, it, it, it's the location, the organisation um, was just brilliant, it was a really well run, well run sort of week, so thanks to everyone. Thanks very much, Anita. And yes, thanks again to all our contributors mm -hmm. for their for their insights. So we do have a bit of time for questions at this point. We thought we should provide you with some information uh, where you can go and look further. So there are there were uh, there was a quite an active conference in terms of tweeting under a number of different hashtags, hashtag IDW 2016 and Hash, uh, hash RDA plenary for the plenary event. For those of you that are looking at the hash IDW 2016 hashtag now and are wondering why there are so many tweets about deafness, uh, it's because after the we ran our event, there was International Deafness Week for 2016, and we got a hashtag collision. But the archive that's listed on the uh, screen there. Um, Please don't try and mem memorise that. It will be in the slides which will be available after the session on the ANS events page. But that just captured the tweets for, for these events. Uh, the programs themselves uh, are online with links to the presentations. Um, so if you want to download the slides or look at the slides, you can. There's also videos for much of the material. Not, however, the breakout sessions for the actual Research Data Reliance Plenary, only for the, the sessions that were happening in the main room. Um, much of the work of RDA, as you've heard already, happens in working groups and interest groups, and these were in eight parallel tracks, something like that. Uh, and so there isn't video from those, but there's certainly video from the, the main space. And uh, most of the groups that held the breakout sessions have material either linked from the program or from their group pages. Yep. Uh, and finally, there's uh, some blog posts that are being aggregated together. They currently sit under CoData at the moment, or the CoData.org website, um, but there's blog posts from a whole range of people, including RDA people, um, mm -hmm. that's simply being used as a point to pull them together. So lots of additional information for people to go and look at if they want. Uh, so having said that, Susanna, um, uh, all right, thank you, yes, uh, Stephanie has reminded me that uh, too much RDA is barely enough, um, to quote Roy and HG, and if you would like uh, more information on RDA, Stephanie and I are running two bots at eResearch. One is essentially on why you might want to use the Research Data Reliance to solve particular data problems. So you've heard already today for a number of people about how they got value out of the RDA experience and process in realising other people are tackling the same problems. We're running a BOF that will uh, help you understand how you can get more involved in RDA in terms of building solutions. And then the second BOF is focused on how you might um, adopt some of those outputs that we talked about at the start of this, uh, this webinar. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, they'll be on at the uh, e-research conference if you're coming to that. And bearing in mind that RDA has produced quite a few more outputs than the ones that were presented at this particular plenary because the plenary output sessions only talk about outputs that are either presented for the first or sort of that are where working groups finish and present their outputs at this plenary or at where they are going to be finishing in the next six months and will be presenting their final outputs at the next plenary. So there's a sliding the, window. Yeah, so and on the RDA web page website, there is a page under outputs and recommendations called all outputs and recommendations, I think, and there you'll find a list of um, probably over a dozen at this point. Okay, so Susanna, has anyone typed any questions in chat? Actually, no. Um, okay, well, uh, so if no one has any questions, this is your, this is your last chance. Oh no, actually, no one's going okay. here. we go. What do you think of the priorities for ANS in the follow-up? Uh, the follow-up to International Data Week? I guess the priority, well, hmm, I don't know if I can speak for ANS as a whole. I can certainly speak personally, and I should explain 
that Stephanie and I, we work for ANS, but in a sense, we, we work for RDA as well. Stephanie, in fact, literally works for RDA as their director of operations three days a week. And I work, in air quotes, for RDA um, as co-chair of the technical advisory board. And so I suppose, do you, want to, do you want to give your answer first, then I'll give my answer? Okay, so my answer would be um, really very much in line with the slide that's on the screen at the moment. I would like to see more Australians using the RDA processes to solve data problems, so more involvement in working groups and interest groups. The fact that more people from Australia were coming to this event was great. Um, the positive stories that we've heard today was, was also great. I'd like to see more Australians involved in using RDA and not just in running it. And then the second thing I guess I'd like to see from an ANS perspective is more adoption of the outputs. So um, some of you may have heard Rhys Francis in the past talk about how Australia should be not trying to reinvent the wheel all the time in the research infrastructure. We should be adopting what's happening overseas. RDA is a great place to go to look for things that you can adopt. Data citation that Stephanie mentioned is just one example of that. So more people involved in um, Solving problems through RDA and more people involved in picking up outputs would be my answer. Stephanie. Yeah, so more people in Australia getting benefits out of the research data lines is, I guess, how, how we could summarise that. And part of why we are doing those birds and feather sessions at U Research is because not everybody knows a lot about the research data lines. And we just want to make sure that more people have a chance of hearing about it and hearing mm -hmm. what it can do for you, really, and how you can how you can help it as well. So it, it can be a win-win situation. Um, as the RDA Director of Operations, I have a strongly internal role. So at the moment, I'm actually trying to make sure that some of the processes within the Research Data Alliance work more smoothly. So that is my sort of my, my priority following up from um, International Data Week, which has nothing to do really with, yeah, with the arts, the, the outward reaching phase of RDA, but more with making sure that people actually can use the Research Data Alliance and can get benefit from it by making sure the organisation works with them. It says, just wondering if the RDA website for collaboration or OSF website. The working group I joined was using OSF. As in OSF.io. So the OSF.io, if, if I understand the question correctly, OSF.io is a hosted platform for e-research collaboration. You can think of it as being a little bit like a, a light form of a virtual laboratory, although it's mostly focused on um, managing data rather than on integration with tools. You could use it for some of the kind of collaborative activity that the RDA also supports, but uh, the intention of the Research Data Alliance website is basically to do two things. Um, the first is to provide information about what RDA is and how it's structured and what it does and its outputs, as Stephanie's already identified. But there's a second, if you like, once you, once you log in as a registered RDA member, um, and anyone can become an RDA member for free, once you log in and join particular groups, each of those groups have their own space with um, mailing lists and wikis and file repositories that they can use to manage their own processes and outputs. And one of the reasons that some people decide to use the RDA system is simply because it gives them all of that collaboration infrastructure for free. So I hope I answered what I think the question was. Maybe just to add one thing. So as Andrew said, the RDA website, of course, also has the, the purpose of just showing information on the RDA, but it also uh, we also have requests for comments open uh, normally. So oh, that means um, on the RDA website you can find documents that are currently under what we call community review and where we actively ask the community to provide comments. And that for that purpose, the RDA website is a central point to do so. Uh, it's, it's Malcolm, I just want to comment to back something up Andrew said. Uh, I think one of the priorities for other institutions in Australia is to participate more in the review of the outputs before they become outputs. So they're published on the RDA website. So I guess what we're looking for is feedback on whether uh, 
uh, well, how practical their recommendations are and whether they can be adopted within your institution. So even if it's a good comment or a, or a negative comment, constructive criticism, it, it would be useful because uh, no comment doesn't give you a, a good direction whether it's a good recommendation or not. So the more feedback about the outputs that are up for community review, the better. So I'd like to see more Australian Australians involved with that process. No, that's a, that's a great point, Malcolm. Um, I was taking a slightly parochial tad focus on things rather than thinking broadly, more broadly. And I should emphasise the, the incredibly valuable role that the organisational um, assembly members play in RDA because they, they're the people who are working in organisations that are going to be adopting the outputs. So their, their role in the RDA processes is extremely important. Uh, any other questions, Susanna? No, there's another one. It says, is there a particular page for these draft outputs? Is there a particular place for the draft outputs? Is that the question? Yes. Is there a particular page for these draft outputs? Okay. Yes, the outputs page. Um, yes. So there's, on the one hand, there's the outputs page, which is under outputs and recommendations, all outputs and recommendations. That, that's a list of outputs. The first set is endorsed outputs, which means they're the ones that have already gone through the review process. Then we have uh, recommendations currently being endorsed or something mm -hmm. like that. Hang on, let's just have a look. Um, what's it actually called? Recommendations with RDA endorsement in process. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that we actually really like comments. most comments on. And we do highlight some of these in the request for comments box. Once the, um, once the recommendations have been formally submitted to RDA for consideration, they end up in the request for comments box and that's when we really, really, really want community comments and also comments from the organizational members that are represented by the organizational assembly because what, what we're trying to determine is whether these outputs are actually useful to anyone, to real people, yeah, not just in theory. Yeah, fit for purpose. And yes, fit for purpose and also um, yeah, adoptable with reasonable amount of effort. So yeah, so if you go to rd-alliance.org, uh, right up at the top of the screen there's a, um, the words recommendations and outputs and that will let you get to that. Okay, there's one more comment, uh, question which says, what has been discussed in Denver about the facilities for developing countries? So uh, I can point to a couple of things. Uh, one was, as I mentioned, the RDA summer schools has got a particular focus on um, Improving the, uh, the improving the standard of um, education in data issues for researchers from developing countries. Um, there was a, a keynote from one of the RDA council members, Kay Razaroka from Botswana, uh, talking not just about issues uh, re relating to Botswana, but about um, data issues ranging across the whole of the African uh, continent. And the, I guess the, other, the only other thing I'd point out is that although RDA is currently, the RDA membership is, is drawn primarily from Western Europe and the United States, consciously working to, to expand that out. And so we have um, a, an increasing number of members from South America, uh, and in fact, at this election, the, the current Technical Advisory Board election, which is closing real soon now, uh, one of the candidates is from India. So we are starting to broaden out the, the geographical base for RDA, which from my point of view is extremely welcome. And um, one of the adoption stories that was uh, presented at the RDA plenary was the one about rice. They were working with um, people in the Philippines. Yeah, the International Rice Research Institute. Yes. Uh, and the leader of the interest group on agricultural data is from Brazil, Ooh, no, Argentina. Yeah, so the agricultural, the agricultural cluster of interest and working groups actually has a better um, geographical involved spread, geographical yeah. spread, yes. So uh, Divika Madali, who's from India, she's one of the TAP candidates, she's also heavily involved in the agricultural interest group, for example. Mm. So that, I mean, it's sort of natural that there's it's more of an involvement from uh, South America and Asia. Not so much Africa, I don't think. No, no, it's too. Mm. Okay. 
We have another question which says, CODATA RDA Research Data Science Summer School, will it happen in Australia? If not, why? I have no idea. Um, Can I answer that one? That one? Oh, sure. So this was something uh, we've been talking with Simon from CODATA uh, and Simon Hodson and um, CUSIF and just trying to get our head around what's the difference between what CODATA offers as a summer school and what we offer already in Australia and things like software carpentry. I think we're looking at author carpentry and some of the subcomponents. The thing about the CODATA, uh, especially the one in Trieste, it's a three-week summer school and they did uh, target a lot of, a lot of the participants were funded from various sources from developing countries. So I guess our last conversation around this topic with QSIF is do, do, will people really turn up for a three-week conference in Brisbane or Melbourne or is it better off offered in shorter modules? And if they're in shorter modules, where uh, we already run software carpentry, so what are the missing elements? So definitely like the, uh, the uh, curriculum's open, there's some, um, some parts of the curriculum they offer that we have big gaps in, especially around visualisation and probably some of the HPC uh, machine learning stuff, uh, but I suspect that courses around Australia online that are already meeting that need as well. So probably to reiterate an earlier problem why we wouldn't want to reinvent the wheel if there is some good programs already available. So it's a matter of, I guess, trying to decide do we want a summer school or get more, more uh, managed or focused or get a coherent group of courses together under a, a banner if that makes sense. But definitely the CODATA oh, stuff, sorry, I was going to say the CODATA open, open curriculum, especially if you can find the one at Trieste, is quite interesting to have a look at. Yeah. I'll put the link where the material has been deposited into the slides as well. Mm. And I will also, I should also make the point that the developers of the curriculum for the, the RDA summer school uh, were talking closely with um, David Flanders uh, about the links with the ResBase curriculum, and I believe there's significant overlap between the ResBase curriculum and the summer school curriculum. So in a sense, much of the material that was covered has already been offered in Australia through the ResBase vehicle. Okay, we're, uh, we're over time, so I think we might wrap it up there. Um, thank you all for attending. Thanks, uh, thanks in particular to the Australian attendees who provided their perspective on the event. Um, the slides including those links will be available on the events page real soon now uh, and uh, thanks for coming in, enjoy the rest of your day.